you know, or guards, uh, as people kind of still think of them as, weren't able to intervene to stop these kinds of incidents, but these transport managers will be able to. Can you, what, what, what's your understanding of this? No, the, the transport the transport officers uh, that that are being trained now, and it is interesting that it was only it did start eighteen, and it, it was going to go to only one hundred and twenty, but now two hundred. Um, but they're not they don't have the powers to arrest or detain anyone. So in the event of the what happened with that tagging situation, those transport officers have no more power or authority than the, currently the train managers have. Okay, so maybe they're like uh, you're saying they're a bit like the the slim looking guy outside the bank in a uniform. You know, he isn't going to stop the robbery. Uh, effectively, yes. So in in other countries around you know, England, for argument's sake, have uh, dedicated transport police that have the have the authority to arrest and detain. Uh, the transport officers don't, um, and they don't they won't be doing the safety critical duties that the train manager does. Can I just um, ask what the solutions are to this? Um, we believe the solutions are um, keeping keeping people on board the trains. So at, at the moment, you've got a train driver and a train manager on board every train. By taking that train manager off the train, um, will will actually make the situation worse, not better. Um, so we would actually like to see more people on on board the train. Our members have spoken about wanting to have um, you know ticket inspectors working with the train managers um, to, for an increased presence. So we believe an increased presence of people on board the train. Is, is a better solution than a decrease uh, as what is being proposed. Uh, we've been told only one of the 57 trains hasn't been tagged and taken off the network at some stage. I, I don't have any figures on that. It, 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 it wouldn't surprise me, uh, some of the footage that, that I have seen, but no, that, that wouldn't surprise me, but I've got no figures to, you know, to you know, agree or disagree with that statement. I understand, but we do have half a billion dollars tied up in trains and they are being tagged regularly, so something presumably yep. stew needs to be done. Oh, like it certainly does. There certainly does need to be more done around platforms. Very, very few of the platforms around Auckland um, are actually gated or secured, secure areas. Um, and that's, that's been something we've been asking for, for quite some time, uh, to do more around that work at, at the platforms. So our view is only people that actually have a ticket to drive the train should actually be on a train platform. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. Stu Johnson, the Northern Regional Organiser for the Rail and Maritime Transport Union. It'll be interesting to see when we talk about this in a year's time, uh, what the situation is. What can I ask you about before we go? Just heard Foreign Minister of North Korea speak at UN. If he echoes thoughts of little rocket man, they won't be around much longer. The subtle foreign policy approach of President Trump. Uh, the North Koreans say they'll shoot down the American planes even if they're not in their airspace. That would do it, wouldn't it? In terms of escalating, it would, the... it would certainly escalate, wouldn't it? You know, you get a sense that uh, you know the common, the common word that even is even coming out of the administration, is let's not force a war on our people. You know, and one would hope that they don't force a war on the world, obviously, but inflaming such things as like that is only going to backfire when you've got two people that are obviously think and see the world in different ways than all of us do. I'm old enough to remember no as aspects of 1963 mm. when the whole world, you know, waited on the Bay of Pigs invasion and we were all a bit scared about the potential for war and I kind of feel a little like that today. Mm. Mm. Especially when the Pacific is mentioned relating to missiles. Yeah, especially. Uh, Selwyn, thank you, Selwyn Manning on the panel. Uh, Ella Henry, always a pleasure to see Shout you out. and you too, Selwyn. That's us for another day. Thanks for your company, everybody. We're back tomorrow and Checkpoints with John Campbell's coming up. Kia ora, everyone. Tonight on Checkpoint, North Korea and the United States aren't at war, but they're sounding increasingly like it. Rabbit farming, it's a growing business, but how regulated is it and what are the animal welfare standards? Librarians are being asked to do more to make homeless people feel welcome. Labor and National hold their first caucus meetings at Parliament today as the two parties prepare to start negotiating with New Zealand first. They're beginning to name coalition negotiation team members. So far, neither party has Richie McCaw. Also tonight, speaking of rugby, what happens to the players poached from the Pacific Islands who go to Europe and don't work out when they are so far from home and the Havelock North water crisis and the report. 
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Bat and Tene. A report says the Campylobacter outbreak in Havelock North last year cost about $21 million, with residents the worst affected. The report, commissioned by the Ministry of Health, says contamination of the town's water supply, in which 5,000 people became ill, is the largest incidence of waterborne disease in New Zealand history, Paloma Magoni reports. The biggest share of the $21 million cost was borne by households because of people taking time off work and other activities for illness. That and other inconveniences, such as having to buy clean water, cost residents about $12.4 million. The outbreak cost the local council $4 million. That included investigating the cause of the outbreak, providing clean water, re-engineering the existing water supply systems and paying for an official inquiry. The report says not all consequences of the outbreak can be quantified. These included personal stress and a loss of public faith in the water supply. This is Paloma Migoni. The Labour leader, Jacinda Ardern, says she and her deputy, Kelvin Davis, will head the party's coalition negotiating team, with other members yet to be confirmed. Both Labour and National are getting ready to start negotiating with New Zealand First to try to form a government. Labour will hold talks with both the Greens and New Zealand First, but may use a different team for either talks. Ms Ardern says Labour has some firm views on who'll be in the talks, but won't release any names until later in the week. I can confirm though that yesterday, late yesterday, um, we did reach out to New Zealand First and indicate that whenever they were ready, um, we were uh, happy and available to meet. Jacinda Ardern says her team will be going through their policies to see where there are areas of common ground with New Zealand First and the Green Party. The national leader, Bill English, says he'll name his negotiating team after consulting with New Zealand First later this week. North Korea has been moving warplanes and boosting defences on its east coast after the United States dispatched B-1B bombers to the Korean peninsula over the weekend. South Korea's Yonhap News Agency says the moves north of the border have been noted by the country's spy agency. Yonhap says the United States seems to have disclosed the flight route of the bombers intentionally because North Korea hadn't noticed. Earlier today, North Korea's foreign minister told reporters at the United Nations that the Americans have declared war on North Korea, so Pyongyang reserves the right to take countermeasures, including shooting down US bombers, even if they're not in its airspace. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is promising her party will not lurch to the right as she tries to win back the millions of voters who deserted her in the country's general election. Mrs Merkel's CDU party received the most votes, but hundreds of thousands of people switched their support to the nationalist anti-immigration AFD, which will enter Parliament as the third largest party. The BBC's Damien Grammaticus reports from Berlin. Angela Merkel was today a mixture of determination and contrition. She told Germans her party was the clear winner of the election and said that was no small achievement after already governing Germany for 12 years. She added she will form a new coalition. But the electoral mass means it'll have to be a three-party coalition, the first time that's ever happened in Germany, and it could take months to achieve. Damien Grammaticus. There's a growing fear or among evacuees on the Vanuatu island of Ambai, with shelter starting to run out as thousands more flee the erupting Monaro Vui volcano. 5,000 people, half the island's population, have already been evacuated from the danger zone around the volcano. But residents say ashfall is affecting more communities and people are being scared by the booming of the volcanic eruptions. The chairman of Ambai's disaster committee says they're in desperate need of temporary shelters as thousands more people are expected to arrive at evacuation centres on the western and eastern sides of the island. The airline Virgin Australia says its flights to Bali will stop to refuel in Darwin in case planes need to circle back to Australia due to an imminent volcanic eruption. Volcanologists say there have been thousands of tremors on Mount Agong and magma is moving towards the surface. More than 42,000 people have been evacuated from their homes and authorities have imposed a 12 kilometres exclusion zone around the mountain. Thousands of tourists pour into Bali each day and an eruption could disrupt airline travel. Jetstar and Qantas say they're monitoring the situation. 
The Northland Regional Council has so far been unable to find the owner of the land where the fuel pipeline to Auckland ruptured 12 days ago. Refining New Zealand believes the steel pipe was damaged by a digger before it ruptured, cutting supplies to Auckland for 10 days while it was repaired. The Regional Council is investigating the spill as a potential breach of the Resource Management Act. It says staff have been trying to track down the landowner, but he doesn't live on the lifestyle block and hasn't and isn't listed in the phone book. It's five and a half past five. Sport and French rugby has courted controversy by enrolling the sons of the late All Black great Jonah Lomu to boost their bid to host the 2023 Rugby World Cup. France, Ireland and South Africa are all bidding to host the event and made their presentations to World Rugby in London today. Sports editor Stephen Hewson reports. France flew in seven-year-old Darrell and eight-year-old Brayley, along with their mother Nadine Lomu, to support their bid. Jonah Lomu played three matches in Marseille at the end of his career, and Darrell was born in the French city. France's bid ambassador, the former international Sebastien Chabal, introduced the boys to the presentation, saying they told him they'd love to go to France to experience the World Cup in a country where their father was so happy. The move hasn't gone down well in Ireland, though, which is also bidding to host the tournament, with the Irish Independent labelling the move desperately insensitive and depressingly sad. This is Stephen Hewson. Basketball star LeBron James has praised the American football players who have protested against Donald Trump and accused the US president of trying to use sport to divide the nation. President Trump says NFL players who fail to stand during the national anthem protesting racial inequality should be sacked or suspended. James, who plays for the Cleveland Cavaliers and has won three NBA basketball championships, says sport is something that unites the country. It brings people together like none other. And um, I'm not going to let, while well, I have this platform, to let one individual, no matter the power, no matter the impact that, that he should have or she should have, ever use sport as a platform to divide us. LeBron James, that's the news. A volcano erupts. We are working with the Varuatu police force to move them out from those areas, which is identified as a high-risk area. A veteran rises. Who knows what type of protest there will be. There is no way that our people will ever accept that we will be denied as the tongue of the of this land. And pay skyrockets. Is another human being really worth 200 times another one? Do they deserve 200 times the life opportunities of another person? And I think most people would object to that. Take off with Morning Report. Sky and Aspinner and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, surfing, skateboarding and climbing, not just the domain of privileged kids, we discuss the power of action sports and social development. And after 10, 50 years of the Francis Hodgkins Fellowship and the rich diversity of art and artists it's fostered. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow and warnings and watches are in force for central and southern New Zealand. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. Rain with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms spreading eastwards today. Northwest gales and exposed places, easing to showers west of Tauranga overnight. Waikato to Wellington, including the central high country. Rain with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms, easing to a few showers this evening. Northwest gales easing this afternoon. Gisborne to Wairarapa, scattered rain developing this afternoon, becoming widespread and heavy in Gisborne tomorrow, northwest gales easing this evening. Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, rain with heavy falls, easing to showers in Buller and clearing elsewhere this afternoon. Northwest gales easing, inland showers and possible thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon. Westland and Fiordland, occasional showers, Canterbury to Southland, fine spells, scattered afternoon or evening showers, possibly heavy about eastern Otago today. And for the Chatham Islands drizzle, turning to rain tomorrow. It's just gone nine past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks Katrina, apologies, I was fidgeting like a schoolboy on the mat, wasn't I, while you were reading that news? Yes, no, for once you were okay. I was, oh, thank you, I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Coming up tonight, North Korea and the United States aren't at war, but the language of conflict is getting louder. Rabbit farming, it's a growing business, but how regulated is it? And what are the animal welfare standards? A new report puts a price on Havelock North's water contamination crisis and insurance premiums rise in one flood-prone area. But 
is this a sign of things to come? But first tonight on Checkpoint, both Labour and National held their first caucus meetings at Parliament today. All MPs present, the new and the old, and all hoping they'll be part of the next government. The deputy leaders of both parties say they would stand aside if required in order to give the deputy prime ministership to Winston Peters. So both parties ticking that box. But both parties are still figuring out the best people to conduct negotiations and are trying to identify where they have the most common ground with New Zealand First in policy terms. Taking stock of all this is our political editor, Jane Patterson. Bill English received a rousing welcome from his caucus, with Labour's Jacinda Ardern being greeted in a similar manner by her MPs. Mr English says negotiations with New Zealand First are likely to last two or three weeks, but First National has to decide on its team. That'll be something that I would discuss with Mr Peters. Of course we would want um, cohesive negotiating, a cohesive negotiating process, and we'll just structure it in a way that, that will uh, suit New Zealand first and suit national. Mr English says he's sure Winston Peters will focus on what's best for the country rather than dwelling on anything that's happened in the past, including his description of Mr Peters as a maverick. I've known Winston Peters a long time. Uh, was, you know, in fact, for 27 years, I think we've been in Parliament together, longer than pretty much anyone else in the building. Uh, so there's a lot of things, you know, I'm sure, as I said, a lot of pushing and shoving, political pushing and shoving. We've been in different parties for most of that time. You'd expect that there's, um, you know, some differences of opinion. His colleague Stephen Joyce, who was National's campaign chair, says the negotiations will be about policy. It's not about personalities in terms of my personality or anybody else's. It's about putting together a government for New Zealand. Are you, are you willing, willing, are you willing? I'm going to have to go in because the guy's big guy's going. Are you willing to give up the finance minister role to Winston Peters if it means? The end, end of the day, I'm just happy to serve. Um, and the Prime Minister makes all those calls. This afternoon, Labour's Jacinda Ardern told reporters she had asked her front bench to start a policy comparison between Labour and the Greens and Labour and New Zealand First. She also said she and her deputy, Calvin Davis, would lead Labour's negotiating team, but has not confirmed the other members. Ms Ardern was asked what Labour can offer New Zealand First. Oh, a good working relationship with our senior MPs uh, and a good existing working relationship. Uh, Relationships are important in these negotiations and I'd like to think that we have uh, the existing relationship required to take forward uh, a good negotiation and form a stable, credible, long-term coalition government. Back on the national side, Paula Bennett says she would give up the position of Deputy Prime Minister if that's what's required to make a deal. Oh, I'm not too bothered, to be honest. I um, love what I do. I'd still be Deputy Leader of the party. That's the main thing, really. So we'll just sort of work our way through it. The same question was put to Labour's number two, Calvin Davis. If it has to be, it has to be. So it's something that you're open to then? Yeah, but it's no, not something we would give up lightly, but it's... Uh you know, Jacinda being the Prime Minister is the main focus here. Meanwhile, discussions about who would or would not be on the National Party negotiating team have revived questions about who leaked details about Mr Peters' superannuation overpayment. National's Chief of Staff Wayne Eagleson remains adamant the leak didn't come from anyone in the party. During the election campaign, the New Zealand First leader admitted, after questions from the media, he had been overpaid his pension for seven years but had paid the money back. Three investigations have failed to find out who was responsible for leaking the private information. Mr Eagleson was among those in government who were told officially about the overpayment. However, he told reporters today the leak did not come from him. Categorically, no. Do you know who did? No. How, have you conducted any investigations into the National Party to make sure it didn't come from the New Caucus? It didn't come from the National Party. Mr Eagleson has resigned as National's Chief of Staff and will leave once negotiations to form a government are complete. Bill English says he stands by his original statement no one from his office was responsible for the leak. Look, I just I take people at their word uh, that um, no action was taken by my staff in making that information public. The New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters is in Auckland and is due to arrive in Wellington tomorrow to meet with his new caucus. From Parliament for Cheap Point, Jane Patterson. Let's go to Washington now where the White House insists President Trump has not declared war on North Korea, stating such claims are uh, absurd. No actual war, but the war of words between Washington and Pyongyang is showing no sign of slowing. 
or quietening. The North Korean Foreign Minister says Donald Trump's address to the UN General Assembly last week amounted to a declaration of war and justifies countermeasures including shooting down US warplanes even if they're not in North Korean airspace. Where to next? From that kind of rhetoric, here's the ABC Zoe Daniel from Washington. Leaving the UN after a week of talks, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Yong-ho delivered this parting shot. I would like to add one more thing. In light of the declaration of war by Trump, all options will be on the operations table of the supreme leadership of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The comment refers to Donald Trump's blunt speech last Tuesday when he promised to totally destroy North Korea to defend the US or its allies and belittled Leader Kim Jong-un calling him Rocket Man. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders responded. We've not declared war on North Korea uh, and frankly the suggestion of that is absurd. But the North Korean Foreign Minister said Donald Trump's rhetoric justifies countermeasures, including shooting down US planes even if they're not in its airspace. <laughs> Since the United States declared war on us, we will have every right to take countermeasures, including the right to shoot down U.S. strategic bombers, even when they are not inside the airspace of our country. American B-1B bombers flew off the coast of North Korea on Saturday. Uh, it's never appropriate for a country to shoot down another country's aircraft when it's over international waters. Our goal is still the same. We continue to seek the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That's our focus doing that through both the most maximum economic and diplomatic pressures as possible at this point. Donald Trump tweeted yesterday in regard to the foreign minister and his leader that they won't be around much longer. That's further riled the regime, which has intimated it may get in first. The question of who won't be around much longer will be answered then. Spokesman for the UN Secretary-General, Stefan de Jarek, has repeated the need for a political solution. When you have the rise of tension, the rise of rhetoric, uh, so does the risk of miscalculations. Fiery talk can lead to fatal misunderstandings. Uh, we would want to reiterate that the only solution for this is a political solution. And I would also re reiterate the Secretary General's call for statesmanship, which he delivered in their General Assembly. China has also called for restraint on all sides. It's Zoe Daniel reporting from Washington. Coming up on Checkpoint, we go to Vanuatu, where large numbers of people are being evacuated from uh, beneath a volcano. Um, lots of volcanic activity throughout our larger region, and we're looking at that tonight. Rabbit farming and animal welfare standards attached to it. And Pacific Islands and its rugby players. There are 600 players from with Pacific Island heritage uh, playing professional rugby or semi-professional rugby in Europe. They are often poached by agents out of very small villages in Tonga, Samoa or Fiji. What happens if they get to France or the UK and things don't work out? Well, sometimes actually... It's disastrous. All of that and much more coming up. Don't forget, you can text us 2101, you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ and you can email us checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. It's 18 minutes past five. Thank you for being with us. It was the worst outbreak of waterborne disease in New Zealand's history and now a new report has put a price on Havelock North's water contamination crisis. The report commissioned by the Ministry of Health goes into some detail about the medical impact of the outbreak and translates all of this into costs. And the sum is large. Eric Frickberg has been reading the report and he joins us now live from Wellington. Hi, Eric. How much did this cost? Well, it cost an awful lot of money. It was $21 million in total. And who paid that money? Uh, uh, it was people like you and me, John, if we'd been living there. And there would have been a lot of us. There were 5,088 households who, uh, in which someone at least got sick in this household. And it cost a lot of money, $2,440 per household. Multiply that out, multiply that out, and you get 12.4 million dollars for the household sector. Now that's an awful lot of money, and it's way ahead of the next sector to pay the next largest amount. Local government, 4.1 million dollars, and wow. doctors and hospitals, 2.5 million dollars. Now all that's a lot of money, and it adds up, as I said before, to a total cost of this crisis, 21 million dollars. 
Right. You talked about the impact of households in this community. How does all of this compare with the $200,000 offered by the Hastings District Council and the Hawke's Bay Regional Council for people who had suffered seriously from the disease? Given the figures that you've given us, that sounds woefully inadequate. Uh, pretty much so, $200,000 as you say. Now since then 37 people have applied. They had to have been sick for more than six months and they were. They haven't yet heard whether they got the money. But it doesn't come close to the real costs. Now what people, what happened was people got sick, they couldn't go to work, they couldn't drive their kids to school. They had to, if some of them were okay, they had to drive to get fresh supplies, fresh water, they had to spend a lot of time cleaning the house, doing more laundry and that costs money. But there's more to it. Many people who got Campylobacter got more sick as a result. Three mm. died. Three got Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is very serious. Yeah. Others got something called reactive arthritis. Many already elderly people progressed faster towards frail infirmity than would have been the case otherwise. And if that's not enough, John, there are these, hypertension, lower leg cellulitis, urine retention, delirium and pneumonia. Now, John, all this, as you can imagine, has a has a huge, huge personal cost. But what the authors of this report have done is to look at it economically. They've worked out how much is this worth. They've done that through something called the opportunity cost, which is the value of the next best thing they could have been doing. Now, this sounds like cold-blooded analysis, <laughs> and it probably has a place, but it doesn't come close to addressing the real price that people paid for this disaster. Eric Frickberg joining us live from Wellington. Thank you so much, Eric. We would love to hear from you if you were in the community and you were directly affected, either someone in your family or someone in your workplace or you yourself got sick. Are you satisfied with this kind of analysis and do you feel that the cost to you personally have indeed been taken seriously enough? Do Texas 2101 or you've got, uh, if you've got more to say, then you can fit in a text email, checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. 21 and a half past five, let's go to Vanuatu where half the population of the island of Ambai in Vanuatu has been evacuated in a state of emergency declared after a volcano started spewing out ash. About 7,000 people, all from remote villages, have been taken to safety so far. The volcano known as Monaro has been rumbling for weeks, but its activity increased rapidly and problematically on Saturday. Andrew McRae reports. Monaro towers from the centre of Ambai, an island in northern Vanuatu, about 300 kilometres from the capital, Port Vila. The volcanic alert is now at level four, which means a moderate eruption's underway. Dickerson Tevi from the Red Cross in Vanuatu says 32 evacuation centres have been set up on both the eastern and western sides of the island. The centres are located uh, well away from the volcano in the in the in the safe part of the island, uh, which has been identified. If uh, the situation does uh, upgrade to level five, then uh, it might be uh, reviewed for m maybe an, a mass evacuation from uh, most part of the islands might be expected. Authorities have been using boats and vehicles to move people in a compulsory evacuation. The director of Save the Children Fund in Vanuatu, Georgia Tacey, says people are feeling the effects of the volcano. We have communities on the move because they're seeing, they're not only hearing the volcanic explosions, they can see it and the volcanic ash and acid rain has been present. Authorities in Vanuatu say they're taking action now in case the eruption intensifies. Peter Carissa is from the National Disaster Management Office. The major hazard at the moment is more to do with asphalt and acid rain. We want to be more proactive rather than reactive to uh, some of the volcanic acid. Manuel Amu from Ambai's Disaster Committee says moving people from their homes into an area that has limited housing and food is challenging. He says they're in need of temporary shelters as two to three thousand more people are expected to have to be accommodated at evacuation centres. Dickerson Tevi from the Red Cross says the country's coping at the moment, but that could change. Within the next uh, couple of days, uh, we should be able to see if we will need more assistance, maybe from outside. Uh, at, at the moment, we're, we're still at the early stage trying to assess uh, the situation and just coordinate on the ground, uh, basically. There's been no change in activity from the volcano, which is one of the most active in the world since Saturday's eruption. GNS volcanologist Steve Sherburn says the main eruption has been contained within a large crater. I think from talking to the colleagues over there, it's, it's the potential 
for ash to fall on, on people's homes and, and particularly their, their, their gardens where they grow vegetables and the impact that that's going to have on, on, on people's livelihoods. And, and, and you know, a lot of these people basically grow, grow their own food. A New Zealand Air Force Orion was expected to carry out a flight over the volcano, weather permitting this afternoon. Steve Sherburn says an aerial survey is essential in getting a better understanding of what's happening to the volcano. It's a whole day slog to get from the coast up to the crater. So observations from, from the air are, are, are really key to to understanding what's happening and then and then putting some boundaries on, on the kind of things that are likely to happen. Because if, if, if you don't do that, then, then the civil defence organisation you know, really, really can't gauge the level of response that's required. The Red Cross in Vanuatu says while most of the people evacuated from near the volcano are happy to go, they all want to return home as soon as possible. For Checkpoint, Cor Andrew McCraytene. An animal rescue charity says rabbit meat farming needs tougher regulations after it bought 75 neglected and injured rabbits off Trade Me. The shelter, Hoo-Ha, bought the Manawatu farm for $5,000 after it saw it listed with photos of the animals in cramped bear cages. Eva Corlett reports. When a rabbit meat farm turned up on Trade Me this month, showing rabbits stacked and wounded in wire cages, Hoo-Ha was flooded with messages from people alarmed by the photos. Hoo-Ha's founder, Carolyn Press McKenzie, decided to act and called the farm's owner. I asked him how he cleaned the rabbits, and he said basically you just loose them down. They're all in cages, so each cage is 500 by 500 by 600. It has like a little wooden small chopping board in the corner that they can balance on, and then the rest of the floor is cage sort of mesh floor, and so they used to just sort of hose those floors out. Ms Press McKenzie says the rabbits had no shelter, no bedding or room to stretch. She says every one had an injury. There were old broken legs, there were torn off noses where they'd obviously sniffed through the cage wire to each other and bitten each other and so there were quite a few sort of mangled faces, very long toenails, like long and twisted. Lots of urine scalding, lots of compacted faeces where they hadn't been cleaned well and so the poos had sort of impacted around their rear ends. Ms Press McKenzie decided to buy the farm rather than lodge a complaint with the Ministry for Primary and Industries. We don't protect animals well and as long as there's food, water and shelter, generally how an animal is kept is acceptable. We've been doing this for 17 years now and we've realised that if we go in and ask someone to step in or we wait, often we're disappointed. Often it's, it's just heartbreaking we don't get the end result which is getting those animals to safety. While Hoo-Ha often works with SPCA or MPI, it wasn't confident the rabbits would be promptly rescued because there is no code of welfare protecting them. Ms Press McKenzie says MPI contacted the group after seeing its social media posts and discussed the possibility of a code of welfare. She says that should be a bare minimum to protect rabbits against old school farming practices and put the industry on the radar. If you look at factory farms, chicken, cell crates for pigs and even the way we chain dogs in New Zealand and our, you know, in backyards, there are so many things that New Zealanders as a whole are doing wrong and these codes don't actually protect the animals. So yes, we're very excited that there's going to be change. We know it won't be enough but I guess it's the first step forward. The Hoo-Ha team is now cleaning, clipping, microchipping and de-sexing the rabbits to rehome them as pets. The Ministry for Primary Industries says there are only two registered rabbit meat farms for human consumption in New Zealand. A spokesperson says anyone in charge of animals must comply with the Animal Welfare Act. However, the Ministry says it won't be able to investigate the farm because it has now been dismantled and evidence lost. The Ministry has raised it with the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee, which decides whether to prioritise a code of welfare for rabbit farming. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi. Ko Eva Corlett, tēnei. Almost 29 past five, we head to Northland now and the community of Hikurangi near Whangarei. There, the local dairy has been robbed again, and it's the again that's salient in this intro. That's 11 robberies in 14 years. We're not naming the owner, but he told us robberies, often with weapons, have become so common that despite the fact he still owes money on the shop, he may simply have no choice but to close up. I mean, there was an arm robbery and then a knife robbery, 
and few others that have been chasing me around and I've been chasing them around. Last time, last year, was uh, they came with a kuruba and hit me on the head. I don't know whether you recall or not. I do recall that. Yeah, and now I was at the back sleeping and then this thing, the alarm went off and then I managed to come in the front. But when the alarm goes off, I think the... The people who come to steal, they're not realizing anything that the, when the alarm goes off, we will be coming to the shop, rushing to the shop. But still, they don't, they don't take any notice of it, and they're still in the shop until I come, and then they run away. See, there were four of them, and I was only alone, and I was half asleep, and I don't know what to do. I, I will, this time I will going to claim insurance. I've been claiming insurance before too, but I didn't get much luck. But this time the stock is gone and I don't have money to turn over the stock. So now I need insurance help and I'm fully insured, yes. So hopefully the insurance will going to you know, roll over the money so that I can come on my feet again. But that's not a point. It will going to happen again. And again, and again, and again, it's no stop of it. But how can we stop it is to close, and that will be the end of it. So you're going to close your shop? E uh, eventually, not now, not straight away, but it will going to happen, yes. Maybe six months' time, maybe year's time, but it will going to happen, yes. And they took cigarettes. What else did they, they no, take? No, no, they, they took cigarettes, they took drinks, they have taken chips. Uh, they have taken lollies, they have taken my daughter's uh, go to school, so she had a school bag, uh, glasses was there, I mean, uh, prescription glasses, and um, all the book work that, that she was doing at school, they have taken everything, and the phone as well. They have taken the bag, whole bag actually they have taken. Whatever they can find, they have grabbed it and gone. And this has happened to you in one form or another 11 times? In 14 years, 11 times. So what, what do you reckon? Shall we just continue doing business and getting robbed? I don't know that I could live like that, but sometimes, you, you know, this is your business. You have a mortgage still on your home? Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. right, yes, so you've got yes. to pay the bills. You've invested in that, right? You've been there for how many years? 14 years, so this is a big part of your life. You're open seven days a week? Uh, yes, yes, seven days a week. Are you in there I, every day? Oh, yes, yes, every day, yes. I'm here every day. When did you last have a day off? What's that? What do you mean by day off? Going and, to the loo? And how many hours a day are you open? Uh, I open from, say, like 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So 10 hour days, seven days a week. That's and, right. And your reward for that is to be robbed 11 times in 14 years. Yay. Wonderful. And you are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Uh, coming up on the program, no, no, with business, speaking of business, if you are a talented rugby player and the agents come after you, you can make a lot of money playing rugby in the Northern Hemisphere and for kids who are being poached out of schools in Samoa, Tonga and Fiji, it's a very exciting prospect. But if and when things don't work out, you are a long, long way from home. So some senior players have stepped up with a response to that. Also... If your home has been flood and insurance premiums go up as a result, is this going to be a precedent in terms of all flood prone areas? We look at that and libraries urge to give the homeless, well, a home. 27 and a half, 26 and a half to six. Katrina Baden has the headlines. The Kampala Bacta outbreak in Havelock North last year cost the country about $21 million, with residents the worst affected. A report commissioned by the Ministry of Health says contamination of the town's water supply, in which 5,000 people became ill, is the largest incident of waterborne disease in New Zealand history. 
The Labour leader, Jacinda Ardern, says her party's coalition talks team will be going through their policies to find common ground with New Zealand First and the Green Party. Ms Ardern and her deputy, Calvin Davis, will head to the party's coalition negotiating team to try to form a government. She's confirmed that contact has been made with New Zealand First to let them know the Labour team is ready to start contact, talking. Contact has been made. <laughs> That's right. Um, I don't know how they do that. Um, North Korea has been moving warplanes and boosting defences on its east coast after the United States dispatched B-1B bombers to the North Korean peninsula over the weekend. North Korea's foreign minister has told reporters at the United Nations that the Americans have declared war on his country, so Pyongyang has the right to shoot down US bombers even if they're not in its airspace. Fear is growing among evacuees on the Vanuatu island of Ambai that they may have run out of that they may run out of shelter. Thousands have been fleeing from the island's erupting Manaro Vui volcano. The island's disaster committee says there's now a desperate need for temporary shelters in the evacuation zones. The Northland Regional Council has so far been unable to find the owner of the land where the fuel pipeline to Auckland ruptured 12 days ago. Refining New Zealand believes the steel pipe was damaged by a digger before it ruptured, cutting supplies to Auckland for 10 days while it was repaired. The Regional Council is investigating the spill as a potential breach of the Resource Management Act. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. I'm now making contact with Nona Peltzio. Hi, Nona. Hello. Have you been asked to join a negotiating team? Nobody's asked me anything. No, it's only a matter no. of time. It's only you, John. You're the only one who asked me anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Uh, business confidence has fallen to its lowest level in two years in a new survey, although firm still expect better times ahead yeah. in their business. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Yeah. It's slightly contradictory. Well, it is, but it's pretty typical of the surveys that we get, so that an equal number of optimists and pessimists looking at the economy generally, but then when they look at their own business, a net 30% says, oh, you know, things are pretty good. So I guess when you're looking at your own uh, self and you, can, you have control, you have a bit more optimism, which is good, then when you're looking at the wider picture, and I guess a lot of the political horse trading, you know, that's going to be going on, making contact as yeah, you yeah, were, yeah, yeah. Uh, is actually unsettling people. And, you, and you're seeing that in the market too. We've well, noticed sorry. that in our currency and so on. In fact, I had a couple of fascinating conversations with people who said f fundamentally foreign investors don't really give a terrible damn about who's in government in New Zealand, whether it's national or Labour. What they don't like is the uncertainty around the negotiations. That's right. In other words, if we had had a clear winner on Monday, yeah. it, everything would have been just fine. But without that clear winner, yeah, the markets don't like that. And of course, we've seen that in Germany too. You know, anytime mm. you've got uncertainty, political uncertainty, yeah, people don't like it. And of course, the New Zealand dollar is what the 11th most traded currency in the world. Unbelievable, yeah. So of course, you know, people pay attention, not just within our own borders. We're used to it. I think MMP elections aren't new to New Zealanders, mm. but elsewhere, people don't understand them very well, and they don't really understand what, where you know things are going. And so, yeah, the whole thing is not too hard. We should send that orange man off on a global tour to explain it to people. And they know what, <laughs> what happened to Kathmandu's profit? Up 13%? What's driving that? Well, actually, Kathmandu's doing really well. Their online sales are doing very well. They, they're now accounting for 7.5% of their total sales in Australia and New Zealand and, I guess, wherever else. And so, uh, uh, yeah, their sales rose to 5% to 445 Point three million dollars. A lot of that was online. So that's going so well. They're going to expand their online sales. They're going to have a global website and they're going to sell direct into China and they're testing the market in Europe with wholesaling. So yeah, uh, interesting story. We'll keep you up on that one. What happened on our unsettled markets today, Nona? Well, actually, we, because of Kathmandu, their share price rose more than 6%. That's 18 cents up to $2.27, and that was reflected in our market. So Asia generally has been like kind of negative ever since North Korea decided that the United States is at war. So well, anyways, those markets are not looking that well. But ours rose almost a quarter of a percent, 17 points to 7,887, which is just a handful of points off that record, John. We're going to get there this week, maybe. Uh, the dollar is still weak, though. Drifted lower, a little drifted, really. It is a drift. Uh, 72.5 US cents, uh, 91.2 Australian, 53.7 pence. Nona Peltzio, thank you very much indeed. It's coming up to 21 minutes to six.
two very contrasting stories out of Europe last night about rugby. In one, former All Black Charles Piotto talks about a playing contract with Bristol worth a million pounds in a season. Go, Charles Piotto. While at the same time, across the channel, a group of current and former rugby internationals from Samoa, Tonga and Fiji were launching Pacific Rugby Players Welfare, or PRPW, in France. Already working in the UK, its purpose is to support and protect rugby players with Pacific Islands heritage who don't get million pound contracts like old Charles. With increasingly rapacious and opportunistic agents hunting for the next big thing throughout the Pacific, players sometimes still in their teens can be transported with little or no support to French cities as different from their homes as it's possible to be. There, if they don't get injured, if they click with the club culture, and if they play well enough, they can really make a good living. But if that doesn't all happen, then the fairy tale can go horribly wrong. There are a few scenes in sport quite like what you're listening to. It's 2007, the Rugby World Cup, and in Montpellier, France, the Tongan team is performing the Sippy Day. But then, after the roar of the crowd and a dramatic closing of the gap between the two teams, the Samoan team respond with the Siva Tau. The challenges aren't often seen in France, but the players are. There are more than 600 rugby players with Pacific Island heritage now playing in European rugby leagues. Some are runaway success stories, and some have found themselves heartbreakingly adrift. There's some, some real horror stories that have been going on, uh, just in regard to the Pacific rugby players over here, you know, not having uh, been... Uh, Attracted to the to to the UK and Europe, and 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 then, you know, subsequently just left to their own devices. Uh, some some come out the other side, some aren't so fortunate. That's my Kumanga, former Manu Samoa player and professional player and coach in the UK. Kellett, for Amasino is left out. Baanga, lovely run by Umanga. The flying fullback is in. Lima. Mike Umung is now so established in the UK that his son Jacob has been picked for the England under-20 team and those in the know think that won't be where it ends. But Jacob is Samoan and English. He was born in Harrogate. His family and friends are there, his foundations and support. The challenge is for players the same age as him who've come from Samoa, Tonga or Fiji full of possibility, only to find themselves hopelessly lost. They've been um, taken straight off the, the island, um, put in, a, uh, in an environment they're totally um, um, unprepared for, um, have no idea of, um, and then um, basically um, not really now having the support uh, or knowledge of small print, you know, uh, contracts, um, and things don't go quite according to plan. Uh, no one to turn, turn to. Uh, subsequently, um, I think the, the last name was Sereli Timo, um, took his own life. His name was indeed Isereli Timo, a Fijian player. He'd been signed to a French club but got injured, felt increasingly homesick, began to hate the separation from his wife and two young children, and without the support network to help him cope, he broke. Because he couldn't handle the pressure. Uh, the pressure to perform for the club, uh, pressure, uh, uh, pressure to 
um, provide for his family back in the islands. Um, it all just got too much for him. And when the French newspaper L'Equipe asked what Timor's agent had done to support him, the answer one of his teammates suggested was little or nothing. That's only one of, of the horror stories. So, senior players, among them Mike Umanga himself, Daniel Leo, a former Manu Samoa lock whose pastoral activism off the field has been as committed as his play on it, and Junior Paramore, who played in three Rugby World Cups for Manu Samoa, formed PRPW, Pacific Rugby Players Welfare, to offer support and to lobby for greater care and responsibility from the agents who solicit young players from the Pacific to join European clubs then sometimes disappear as soon as their commission payment has been banked. One of the biggest issues is the unregistered um, agents. will you know someone in the village, um, they'll go and p- pluck someone out, like you say, out of total obscurity, send them over, and then, like you say, um, if, it's, if it doesn't work out, you know, they just slip to their own devices. Which is why PRPW launched in France overnight. Rugby celebrates its Cinderella stories, the boys who come from nowhere to become stars. But it's the boys who come from nowhere who don't become stars who might truly need looking after. And then we're finding more and more of that. Like um, the Cinderella stories, there's, uh, there's, there's so many that, that don't get um, you know, uh, exposed or exposure. Um, the ones that don't work out so well. Some of them are fortunate enough to, you know, come out, um, you know, maybe scarred and, and able to get back to either, you know, New Zealand, Australia, or or back to the islands and you know live to fight another day. But uh, as I spoke before about the lads, you know, there's some people that they don't get to get that opportunity. Mike Umanga, PRPW was launched in France overnight. 40 minutes to six. Librarians are being asked to do more to make homeless people feel welcome. The call has gone out at a librarian's conference in Christchurch where a book club for the homeless at the Auckland Library has been held up as an example of what others could and should be doing. Colin Young reports. While homeless people are a common sight at libraries around the country, so far only Auckland's main library has made a concerted effort to make them feel welcome. A person with no address is not going to be able to take books out. The answer, give them a space where they can leave their books overnight and pick them up again on their next visit. Auckland also offers a book club, a film night and a blog where people can talk about what it's like to be homeless. The president of the Library and Information Association, Louise Lahat, would like to see others around the country follow the city's lead. Even if it's a response to making sure their staff are trained in understanding what the issues are, how to deal with, with people with compassion, but also firmly in terms of mitigating any impact on, on other customers. Louise Lahat says the homeless have as much right as anybody else to access libraries. She notes a number of them are well educated and well read and are not just looking for a warm place to spend the day. If there is behaviour that's unacceptable and that may be because of drug use or mental health issues, then you deal with that behaviour. So libraries do sometimes trespass people and some libraries do have security guards who can help de-escalate issues. But again, it's about the behaviour and not who's doing it. A keynote speaker at the conference, Matt Finch, who's from the State Library of Queensland, says in Brisbane the library is a popular place to keep cool in summer. And he says there's nothing wrong with that. I went to a library in a shopping mall in Brisbane and it was on a sweaty, stinky Saturday afternoon. There was a lady pushing her shopping trolley with stuff around on the ground floor of the library. There were toddlers, there were kids reading comics, there were people doing research, there were people running small businesses. And what the librarians did was they kept an eye on the situation over there in Brisbane to make sure nobody was troubling anyone else, but that no one felt like you're not welcome here just because of who you are. A homeless Christchurch man, Brad Edgeworth, says he mostly uses the library for the internet and always feels welcome there. I just go on Facebook and to keep warm. So keep, keep in touch with people? And, yeah. Yeah. and so what's it like when you're there? Do you, do you feel welcome? Yep. Why is that? No, it's just a warmness yeah. Yeah, of them. Uh, they're like happy chappy hello. 
Mike says he would go to the library if it wasn't for his social phobia, but says from what he's heard, homeless people are already well catered for. I thought it was all good as is anyway, you know, because quite a few of us homeless people go there anyway, you know, to relax, read and jump on the computers. So, but if they were planning to go all the way out, OK. A Christchurch City Council spokesperson says it's looking closely at the work being done in Auckland and hopes to implement many of its initiatives as part of its new $85 million central library, which is due to open next year. In Ōtotahi for Checkpoint, ko Conan Young Tene. 11 minutes to 6, tourists are continuing to pour into Bali despite the threat of a major eruption of the island's Mount Agung volcano. Volcanologists are certain the magma beneath the mountain is moving towards the surface and an eruption, potentially a very major one, is imminent. More than 42,000 people have been evacuated from their homes and authorities have imposed a 12k exclusion zone around the mountain. The ABC's Indonesian correspondent Adam Harvey has this report from Denpasar. The planes keep coming, almost 400 of them each day, bringing a vital commodity to the island. Tourists and their cash. The imminent eruption of Mount Agung hasn't affected the flow of visitors, not yet anyway. Between 50 to 60,000 people come each day. It'll all stop if Mount Agung erupts and launches a sizeable ash cloud into the atmosphere. The volcanic ash is connected to the safety of flights, says Nura Rai Airport's Ari Asanur Rohim. The particles are dangerous to a plane's engine. They're sharp, and if they go into the engine, it affects the safety of the passengers. The Aviation Authority says planes in the air would be diverted to seven regional airports, some as far away as Solo on the island of Java. Those on the ground will be protected as much as possible, with covers over the engines. We've had a meeting with ground handling and the airlines, and we have to be ready to cover the planes. About two hours drive from the airport, there were 64,000 people living within 12 kilometres of Mount Agung. Indonesia's Disaster Management Agency says 50,000 of them are now living in emergency shelters right across the island. The rest, hopefully, are staying with friends and family. The smaller shelters are crowded and uncomfortable, usually single rooms in government buildings where everybody sleeps on the floor. Two Australian women, Robin and Karen from Adelaide, were helping out yesterday in one yes. of the shelters. Yes, yes, helping um, the Bali Red Cross, just doing what we can to help them, visiting people in the evacuation shelters, and they're just taking data, finding out where, what villages these people have come from. So the Aussies need to help. Yes, and yeah. They share this island as tourists, so, and we all need to help. Yeah. It's impossible to say when the volcano will erupt. Most of the experts think it'll be soon. Sutopo, the chief of Indonesia's disaster management agency, says this is an unpredictable business. Indonesia's president, Joko Widodo, has promised to visit the evacuation shelters today, pending, of course, an eruption of Mount Agung. That was Adam Harvey in Denpasar. Let's go to Germany now, where the Chancellor Angela Merkel says her mission is to win back voters who deserted her party in the country's general election as she tries to stitch together a coalition. Mrs Merkel's CDU party received the most votes, but hundreds of thousands of people switched their support to the nationalist, anti-immigration, ultra-right-wing AFD, which will enter Parliament as the third largest party. However, it's very unlikely it will play any part in a new coalition government. There are already signs of division within the AFD since the election result, with the party's co-chair announcing she would not be part of its parliamentary group. From Berlin, the BBC's Damien Grammaticus reports. Angela Merkel strode into her post-election press conference today a mixture of contrition and determination. She's a veteran political survivor, now winner of a fourth term as Germany's chancellor. Her position as Europe's preeminent politician remains unchallenged, but she's undoubtedly been weakened too by this election. Her CDU party won a third of the vote and the seats in the Bundestag, more than 10 percentage points ahead of her nearest rival, but it was still a serious decline in her support, much of it lost to the far-right Alternative for Germany party. 
Natürlich hatten wir uns insgesamt ein besseres Ergebnis erhofft. We had wished for a better result, of course. We're now trying to analyze the votes we lost, especially those which went to the AfD. We want to win those people back by addressing some of their issues. Where they will have to be won back is largely in what was East Germany. In all, a million voters deserted Mrs Merkel's party for the far-right AfD, many because they believe that during the refugee crisis she lost control over Germany's borders. But at the AfD's very first press conference today, splits were already emerging. Frau Petri, one of the AfD's leaders who just won a seat in Parliament, turned on her colleagues sitting alongside her in front of all the assembled journalists. She said they were becoming too extreme. The AfD could never hope to win power. It's been said that the AfD has become an anarchic party that could only be successful in opposition, not to govern. But I want to make real politics, so I've decided that I will not be part of the AfD in the Bundestag. And she walked out. The AfD's remaining leaders are sticking to their line that the influx of a million refugees means Germany is losing part of itself. We don't want that, they said. Germany as a whole now looks to be entering a more fractious and divided period, diverting Angela Merkel's energies as she forms a coalition, then tackles the challenges Germany is facing. The BBC's Damien Grammaticus from Berlin. It is five minutes to six. You're with Checkpoint on RNZ. Thank you for being with us. Coming up, flood-prone areas and the cost of insurance. But an environmental group says a pile of asbestos close to a popular walking track on Auckland's Rangitoto Island has been there for 40 years and there's no firm time frame to have it safely removed. The control mine base was built during the Second World War and was demolished in the 70s. Since then, tons of asbestos-covered material has been sitting out in the open. The Department of Conservation is responsible for the island and says it's applied for government funding to help it clean it up, but is waiting to find out if its bid has been successful. Sally Murphy reports. The control mine base is listed as number nine on the government's priority list of toxic waste sites to be cleaned up. Doc would not be interviewed about the site, but in a statement, Auckland Operations Director Andrew Bowick says the asbestos poses no immediate risk to the public or the environment if it's left undisturbed. The department put out a tender to remove the waste in 2015, but the tender was later cancelled. RNZ have not been told what led to that decision. Now DOC has applied for funding under the Ministry for the Environment's Contaminated Sites Remediation Fund to help with the clean-up. Sustainable Coastlines helps support volunteers carry out coastal clean-ups. Its co-founder Camden Howitt says they first called on DOC to take action six years ago after finding the site while doing a beach clean-up. Essentially, it's very close to a public walkway. You know, we, we call our Hodaki Golf Islands the Treasured Islands. That's one of Doc's campaigns out there, and very close to one of those public walking spaces is a, a large deposit of asbestos, which obviously has some uh, fairly well-known human health hazards. Doc says the site is closed to the public, but Mr. Howitt says if people want to access it. Then they can. And anyone that can, can and wants to land a, a, a craft on that island or, or go for an explore around the rocks, which we're all welcome and, and able to do as Kiwis walking around the, um, the high tide mark, then anyone that does that can, can access it, absolutely. Mr Howitt says he can understand Doc can't afford to clean up everything quickly, but it's a shame the site has been left for so long. Ricky Jones is the president of the Demolition and Asbestos Association and says cleaning up the area will be a big job. Logistically, there would be a lot involved in uh, removing the asbestos from the island. Depending on the, the extent of it, how, how big it is and how much asbestos there is, you may need a barge and some equipment and machinery. And there's a process as well where you've got to carry out background air monitoring, clearance testing. Getting across the island and getting it back would be, would, would be quite a lot a large task. Dave Furt worked as an archaeologist for DOC for 25 years and says the department is struggling to deal with all the problems it inherited from other government agencies when it was formed 30 years ago. The thing is, is that DOC's got so many really, really important things to do um, in terms of both the natural and uh, historic management of the, the huge area of land it looks after without having to um, you know, sort of basically clean up messes that um, shouldn't have been left behind in the first place. 
TikTok says if funding is granted, it hopes to have the asbestos removed from the island and disposed of by early next year. In Auckland for Checkpoint, Sally Murphy. One and a half minutes to six. If you're watching, you're about to get the added bonus of Katrina Batten walking behind me with the six o'clock news headlines. Hold on, we're just going to pause for that. Nice. <laughs> she hit me. She hit me. <laughs> There'll be witnesses to that. She hit me with the scripts of six o'clock as she reads the news. Bear that in mind. Uh, lots of feedback coming in tonight, and we really appreciate it. This is a lovely one. Well, it's a bit sad, but it's really lovely. Reverend Simon Martin from Nelson. Yesterday, I ministered at a funeral in Nelson for a homeless man at which several Nelson Library staff attended and spoke lovingly about a dear man they got to know very well. We've got a great central library here. It certainly sounds like it, Reverend Simon Martin, and it's a very uh, lovely text to have sent us. That's off the back of Conan uh, Young's story about libraries and their duty of care to the homeless who want to uh, go in there during the day. Yvonne says, nice story, good on Auckland Library staff. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, lots of feedback about water. Ironic that one of the chief players responsible for the dreb for Havelock North water poisoning has just been elected as the local MP. Go figure. And another texter announced even the households that didn't get sick were very affected. Schools were closed, so one parent from every household was taken out of work for the duration. We really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you for joining in. It's coming up to six o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Kia ora, good evening. Ko Katrina Batten aho. Political parties are firming up their negotiating teams as they look to begin coalition talks to try to form a government. Labour will hold talks with both the Greens and New Zealand First and National will talk with New Zealand First. Here's our political reporter, Demelza Leslie. Both Labour and National held their first caucus meetings at Parliament today and are trying to identify where they have common ground with New Zealand First and its policy line. The Labour leader, Jacinda Ardern, says she and her deputy, Calvin Davis, will head the party's coalition negotiating team, with other members yet to be confirmed. The National leader, Bill English, says he will name his negotiating team after consulting with New Zealand First later this week. The Green Party has named a five-strong negotiation team fronted by its leader, James Shaw. New Zealand First will hold a caucus meeting at Parliament tomorrow. From Parliament, Demel Zalesley. The Ministry of Health has found Havelock North's water contamination cost about $21 million. Its report says the outbreak was the largest incidence of waterborne disease in New Zealand history and the biggest cost was borne by households. It says with people taking time off work for illness and other inconveniences, such as having to buy water, households forked out almost $12.5 million. The ministry says the water contamination cost local government $4 million, which included investigating the cause of the outbreak, providing water and re-engineering water supply systems. An earthquake with a magnitude of 6.5 has hit off Fiji. The quake was 100 kilometres deep and struck south of the Fijian islands. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Centre says there's no threat of a tsunami. Indonesia's National Disaster Agency is warning the Mount Agung volcano on the island of Bali has entered a critical phase and an eruption is imminent. Nearly 60,000 people have now fled the slopes of the volcano and a 12-kilometre exclusion zone has been put in place, but some have been reluctant to leave their livestock. The BBC's Indonesian editor Rebecca Henschke reports. Volcanic activity is increasing and tremors are becoming more frequent to the National Disaster Agency spokesperson Sutopo Nugroho. They could not, however, predict the timing of an eruption, he stressed. Nearly 60,000 people have now fled the area around the volcano, packing into temporary shelters or moving in with relatives. But concern for livestock is stopping others from leaving. A local animal rights group is trying to help, evacuating animals left behind or releasing them. Rebecca Henschke. And a resident on Ambai Island in Vanuatu says the volcanic eruption there is worse than the last one in 2005. A state of emergency has been declared and at least 5,000 people, half of the island's population, have been evacuated from the areas most affected by ash since the volcano began belching on Saturday. The local disaster committee says people on the island need urgent help with food, water and other supplies. 
A Christchurch City Councillor says he's disappointed the police are backing down over proposed regulations of sex workers. The police have withdrawn support of a proposed bylaw that would limit the movement of street-based sex workers. The City Council proposed the move after complaints from residents in St Albans, north of the Central Business District. A councillor, Dion Swig, says he's not happy the police have turned around their position. Mr Swig says the council needs to now find ways to keep encouraging sex workers to move away from residential areas. From our perspective, it's just like actually we've got to respond to our residents and actually try and help them and encourage the workers in a multitude of different ways to actually respect the wishes of the residents on that street. So yeah, it is a bit of a disappointment that the police did that 180 on this issue. Dion Swig says he believes the only way of legislative approach can now be taken as if Parliament gets involved. Police have caught a prisoner who escaped this afternoon from the Whangarei Courthouse. The man, who's 29, has been remanded in custody but managed to escape at about 2 o'clock. He was recaptured a couple of hours later, a few kilometres away. He'll appear in court again tomorrow morning, charged with escaping custody. The police have resumed their search for Stephen Lowe from Dunedin, who's been missing for more than a week. Mr Lowe, who's in his 50s, was last seen when he left his work in Portsmouth Drive in the morning of Friday 15th of September. Yesterday, the police suspended the search to assess areas of interest. The police say searchers have again been exploring the Catlins Conservation Park. The Brazilian government has revoked a controversial decree that would have opened up a vast reserve in the Amazon to commercial mining. Environmentalists are celebrating what is a major government backdown. The BBC's Katie Watson has more. The reserve of more than 40,000 square kilometres is home to indigenous tribes as well as being rich in gold and other minerals. It's been protected since 1984, but the Temer administration last month said it would open up the area. It was a move that caused outrage. A court suspended the measure, saying any change to the reserve status had to be considered by the Brazilian Congress. Katie Watson reporting. It's five and a half past six. Sport and the Kiwis Rugby League World Cup hopes they have suffered a major setback with confirmation the playmaker, Kieran Foran, has been ruled out through injury. New Zealand Rugby League says Foran's new NRL club, the Canterbury Bulldogs, has made him unavailable for the tournament so he can recover from a quad and back strain which plagued him during this season with the Warriors. The World Cup will be jointly hosted by New Zealand, Australia and Papua New Guinea and kicks off late next month. The All Blacks were presented with jerseys and introduced to the crowd when they attended a football match at the famous Argentinian club River Plate, although they were unable to inspire the hosts to a win. The All Blacks can successfully defend their rugby championship title with victory over the Pumas and Buenos Aires this weekend. Halfback Tawera Kerbalo says it was a unique experience to go to the most successful football club in Argentina. The atmosphere was... Uh... It was um, probably probably haven't seen anything like that before. They get right into it, and there was a, there was a bloke that was on the drums for the whole game, eh? So, head off to him. Um, we really enjoyed the singing, even though we couldn't understand what they were saying. Probably wasn't very nice things about the other side, that's for sure. Tawera Kerbalo. Arsenal have kept up their 100% home record this season with a 2-0 win over West Bromwich Albion in English football's Premier League. The West Brom midfielder, 36-year-old Gareth Barry, appeared in a record 633rd Premier League game, surpassing the mark set by former Manchester United winger Ryan Giggs. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Art in Prison. Something to do when you're doing time. But will it be useful when you're not doing it anymore? Neil Beals and Jackie Moyes explain the concept. We have this week's edition of Forecast, in which a panel of four comedians predicts the news before it happens. They certainly didn't pick the election last week, and our economist Brian Easton ponders the fiscal implications of said election result. On nights from after the news at seven, with me, Brian Crump, on RNZ National. Met service weather now through to midnight tomorrow and warning and watches are in force for central and southern New Zealand. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. Rain with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms spreading eastwards today. Northwest gales in exposed places, easing to showers west of Tauranga overnight. 
Waikato to Wellington, including the central high country. Rain with some heavy falls and possible thunderstorms, easing to a few showers this evening. Northwest gales easing, uh, or should have eased this afternoon. Gisborne to Wairarapa, scattered rain developing this afternoon, becoming widespread and heavy in Gisborne tomorrow. Northwest gales easing this evening. Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, rain with heavy falls, easing to showers in Buller and clearing elsewhere this afternoon. Northwest gales easing, inland showers and possible thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon. Westland and Fiordland, occasional showers, Canterbury to Southland, fine spells, scattered afternoon or evening showers, possibly heavy about eastern Otago today. And the Chatham Islands drizzle, turning to rain tomorrow. It's coming up to nine past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. The deputy leaders of National and Labour say they would make way for Winston Peters to take the deputy prime ministership if that's what it takes for their party to seal a deal with New Zealand First. Both Labour and National were back at Parliament today. All the caucuses there, new MPs and returning MPs, preparing to start negotiations with New Zealand First to try to form a government. They're still figuring out the best people to conduct negotiations and are trying to identify where they have common ground with New Zealand First and its policy lineup. Jacinda Ardern this afternoon announced that she and her deputy Kelvin Davis would lead Labour's negotiating team, but will reveal who else is on it closer to the time of formal negotiations kicking off. She told reporters at Parliament she did not have a timeline for when those talks will begin. I can confirm though that yesterday, late yesterday, um, we did reach out to New Zealand first and indicate that whenever they were ready, um, we were uh, happy and available to meet. And there was a chief of staff level? We did that to the chief of, at's chief of staff level. No, I have not spoken um, directly to Mr Peters yet, but I respect that he's taking um, the time to talk with his colleagues uh, and, uh, and others, uh, and that's time and space uh, uh, that we will be respecting. Do you think they might be ready? Uh, no, I don't have an indication as yet. Would you expect to sit down and have any sort of formal talks before October the 7th? Oh, look, I haven't necessarily set that expectation. I think, though, that it would be prudent of all the political parties to go and do the preparatory work um, because we are working to quite a tight timeline. Um, but I fully expect as well that we won't have anything really formalised until we have those special votes in, and that's a fair expectation. What can you offer Winston Peters in terms of trust? Sorry, what? What can you offer Winston Peters in terms of trust? A good, or a good working relationship with our senior MPs uh, and a good existing working relationship. Relationships are important in these negotiations and I'd like to think that we have uh, the existing relationship required to take forward a good negotiation and form a stable, credible, long-term coalition government. He's cut the Greens out of the equation before. Would you be happy for him to do so again? As I've indicated, I think we need to go into these negotiations, of course, accepting that they carry at the moment 6% of the vote. Do you respect Mr Peter? Yes, I do. Particularly as a senior member of parliament uh, with a lot of experience. Do you trust it? You yes, I do. You wouldn't have a three-way negotiation. Can you just explain why that is? Yeah, no, what I set out yesterday was my expectation would be that we'd have talks individually um, with, with each of those parties separately. There may be a set of circumstances where further down the track that might be something that, you, um, that we instigate. But at the moment I see them as being individual negotiations. So Jacinda Ardern, earlier in the day, the National Party leader, Bill English, told reporters there are ongoing discussions between his office and Mr Peter's office about the logistics of setting up a negotiation meeting. Well, there's, there's just ongoing discussions about that. As you know, Mr Peters has been up north and he's travelling. I don't think we would uh, get too concerned about uh, the way things are moving. Um, he'll, he'll be coming back to Wellington. He's got to work, address his own caucus and will meet with his own caucus and then um, begin negotiations as, as uh, everyone would expect. He wasn't that happy about the court him in Are you uh, worried about that at all? Oh, no, I'm not worried about that. Uh, I've known Winston Peters a long time. Uh, was, you know, in fact, for 27 years, I think we've been in Parliament together, longer than pretty much anyone else in the building. Uh, so there's a lot of things, you know, I'm sure, as I said, a lot of pushing and shoving, political pushing and shoving. We've been in different parties for most of that time. You'd expect that there's, um, you know, some differences of opinion. But uh, I think I've always been clear that uh, I understand his role, uh, given the result of the election. He's an experienced politician. He takes his role very seriously. 
and uh, we would expect to be able to begin negotiations on that basis. Do you think he can get over some of the grudges he has with the National Party? Well, I think, as I said, he understands his role, and the role here is to, uh, now that we've had an election where the people have spoken, uh, which is at you know, the core of our democracy, then it's up to the political party leaders to form the kind of government indicated by the election. And Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Peters knows that as well as anybody, and I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, he takes that role responsibly, seriously and responsibly. Bill English speaking at Parliament earlier today. We've spoken about this in general terms on Checkpoint before. In fact, we've talked to the Insurance Council about the likelihood with climate change of flood-prone areas eventually having to pay increased insurance premiums to be covered against floods. Well, here is what seems to be a very specific example. A man whose home was gutted in the Edgecombe flood is disgusted after being told he has to pay three times his usual insurance bill and his insurer says others could expect rises of up to 30%. Now, Val Ware's Tafara Place home is still uninhabitable after it was flooded when the town stopped bank burst in April. Tom Furley reports. Like many Edgecombe residents, the past few months have been tough for Val Ware and his wife after their home was yellow stickered. The water got into the house, so everything that came in contact with the water, which was all the furniture, everything low down, had to be binned about 600 mils deep in the garage. So everything in there had to be binned. Yeah, we would just managed to rescue clothing and things like that, which were above ground. While insurance claims for his car and contents have gone off without a hitch and his house repairs have been paid for, he got a nasty shock when he went to renew his tower home insurance policy. They put me policy up from 1500 last year to 5300 this year. Well, I'm highly pissed off, aren't I? Val Ware says in order to drop his premium, he had to increase his excess from $250 to $1,000. He says there has also been a $10,000 flood and landslip excess added on. I'm 80 years old. I'm going on a pension. That's over $100 a week. Where's a pension to get that money from? Or anybody for that matter. However, Mr Weir says after complaining, his policy has been dropped to over $3,000, but it is still twice what it was and what he's been quoted elsewhere. He says he hasn't heard of anyone else having similar increases and local insurance brokers spoken to by RNZ News say it appears to be an anomaly. Val Weir has been told the increase is a result of losing his no-claims bonus. David Sparrow from AMP Fakatane Insurance Services says the increase doesn't sound right. I find it difficult to believe. I, uh, in fact, it's outstanding. I, I just incredible. Normally, a no claims bonus is, is a maximum of 60% of the company premium. That's without earthquake and fire service levies and GST, etc. So, if you lost that, it still doesn't come to 600%, does it? He says not much has changed with insurance policies for local houses since the floods. We've had no changes because of the flooding to current clients. In fact, we had a house renewed in September and there was no change in premium. AA Insurance says it does not plan on increasing premiums as a direct result of the Edgecombe flooding, saying it already factors in those types of weather events into its policies. A spokesperson for IAG, which owns NZI, Lumley, State and AMI, says it has no immediate plans to increase costs at this stage. Tower says it has worked with Mr Ware to reduce his premium. However, the price increase is due to things like his property's risk, as well as the removal of his no-claims discount. It says there has been no blanket increase for Edgecombe. However, a spokesperson said on average customers in the region could expect prices to rise by 15 to 30 per cent because of higher reinsurance costs and increased risk. Mr Ware says insurance is a necessary evil. I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because this policy is due on the 6th of October and I've told them, take it out of my account, I'm going to pay it. No worries about that. But then I'll be looking round once I'm clear, once everything is settled. Tower Insurance expects to complete repairs to his property by Christmas and says it has settled on almost half of its Edgecombe housing claims so far. For Checkpoint, Tom Furley. 18 minutes past six. Iraqi Kurds have cast their vote in a controversial referendum 
about independence. The poll went ahead despite fierce objections from the central government in Baghdad, which described it as illegal. There were also warnings from Turkey and the UN over fears that could be destabilising in an already fragile area. The outcome of the non-binding vote is expected to be overwhelmingly in favour of Kurdish independence. The BBC's Orla Guerin sent this report from Erbil. <laughs> waiting patiently, as they have for generations. Kurds arriving before the polls opened, defying the international community and the government in Baghdad. First in line, 65-year-old Azad. I came here at 6 in the morning, he told us. This is the greatest day of my life. And for many, it's a day of remembrance, like the Ali family who lost Jaffer, a proud Peshmerga fighter killed last year by the so-called Islamic State. His widow says the vote has brought him back. It's a very happy day for him and for us. We feel like he is right here. He sacrificed himself for this land. His blood was not shed in vain. Then, at last, time to cast her ballot. We hope that we are getting our freedom, she says. But this vote is being watched anxiously by neighbouring states and by the West. The fear is it could spark new conflict, and not only in Iraq. Kurds say that what's happening here today is about self-determination, about democracy in action. Far from trying to stop them, they say the international community should be giving them strong support. There is a real sense here of history in the making, and whatever comes next, the votes being cast today could reshape the Middle East. Even before the result, Kurds took to the streets in the city of Kirkuk. We are free now. The oil-rich city is controlled by Kurdish forces, but also claimed by the central government in Baghdad. And the divisions here are now all too clear. In Arab neighborhoods, we found a very stark contrast. No referendum fever here. Riyadh Abdel Sattar didn't vote and is worried about the future of Iraq. Do you feel like you might lose your country? Yes, he says. We didn't before, but we do now. But for the Kurds tonight, time to celebrate. They say the referendum is a mandate for negotiations with Baghdad. They won't be redrawing borders or declaring independence in the morning, but they have passed a point of no return. That was the BBC's Orla Guerin in northern Iraq. Not only are they at the centre of a humanitarian crisis, but the rights and status of Rohingya Muslims who fled into Bangladesh are now in question. More than 400,000 Rohingya have fled their homes in Myanmar's Rakhine state due to a violent army crackdown. A senior Bangladeshi minister has said they won't be afforded official refugee status. Won't. The ABC South Asia correspondent James Bennett reports from Bangladesh. In the hot sun, they wait. Many newly arrived Rohingya have no documents whatsoever and this is a days-long quest for legitimacy. I came every day here for the past eight days and went back due to the large crowd, says Rohingya man Sami Ullah. Today, though, the 29-year-old came very early and after five hours reached the front of the line. He's asked basic questions about his family, when he fled and from which village. Inside, he's photographed and fingerprinted, and 20 minutes later... A Bangladeshi border guard calls his name and presents him a laminated card. Outside, he holds it up proudly, but admits he isn't really sure what it means. Authorities say, take this card, it will be beneficial for you, he says. Although small and poor, over the years Bangladesh has accepted waves of Rohingya refugees fleeing violence in Myanmar. 
Approximately 300,000 were thought to be here before this latest and largest exodus, escaping what the UN calls textbook ethnic cleansing by the military in response to Rohingya insurgent attacks last month. Faced with over 430,000 new arrivals in a month, the government here has been open. They're welcome for now, but it doesn't want them staying. On Sunday, briefing the press after a law and order cabinet meeting, Industry Minister Amir Hossein Amu said they wouldn't be declared refugees. At present, we do not have any plan to give any refugee status to Rohingya. But the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Philippa Grundy, says under international law, the Rohingya must be protected. People that are fleeing from violence that are under the conditions in which these people have fled are refugees. The director of Human Rights Watch's refugee program is Bill Freelich. Even if they haven't signed the Refugee Convention, they have obligations under what's called customary international law you know, not to push people back to places where they would face these serious harms. Bangladesh's government does have another incentive to gather this data. Several government figures have expressed concern about potential radicalisation in the camps and this registration is a golden information gathering opportunity. Industry Minister Amir Hussain Amu again. The reason behind the biometric process is to keep record of Rohingya. We want them to go back to their own place. Rohingya man Sami Ullah says he'd happily return but only if Myanmar will guarantee peace and security something that right now seems a very distant prospect. That was James Bennett from Cox's Bazaar in southern Bangladesh. It's coming up to 25 minutes past six. The Christchurch residents who fought long and hard to curb the sex trade in their neighbourhood are outraged the police have given up enforcing proposed regulations. Some residents north of the central business district have been pushing for tighter regulations for years, saying they're being abused by sex workers and their properties are being vandalised. Earlier this year, the police said they would enforce a proposed council bylaw, but now they've done a U-turn. Logan Church reports. Some residents in the leafy suburb of St Albans have received a letter saying the police will no longer enforce the proposed sex worker regulation. One of those residents is Matt Bonas who has been fighting for a crackdown on sex workers in his neighbourhood for years. Mr Bonner says his family has been shouted at by sex workers, his property vandalised and had needles and other litter left strewn across his driveway. He says the letter is the final straw. We're now effectively being told that this is the new normal and you just have to live with it and we don't care about the disruption and we're just tired and frustrated. I mean, to the point where last night my wife and I are effectively looking at houses elsewhere or going to high court because effectively they're the two choices we now have. The same letter, signed by the police and the council, was sent to the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective and claims that enforcing the regulation is difficult under the current law. The U-turn by police comes after extensive debate about whether the council should introduce a new bylaw that would limit the movement of sex workers in residential areas. The Prostitutes Collective's national coordinator, Catherine Healy, welcomes the letter and says it shows a non-regulatory approach is the answer. And I think that's important that the police came to the conclusion that they didn't want to return to those days either where they were arresting sex workers. We've noted since 2003 when the law changed that the relationships with the police had improved dramatically and you know for the sex workers safety and everyone's safety it's important that we not see a reintroduction of tension. The issue escalated after the Christchurch earthquakes when the traditional red light district on Manchester Street was cordoned off. The central city is now open for business again but Mr Bonner says almost seven years later not all of the sex workers have left the suburbs. He says he doesn't understand why the police have changed their position. Now the police have said, actually, we won't uphold that at all. And yet the police are perfectly prepared to uphold uh, window washing, uh, boy races, and they actually tried to get the council to put a bylaw for loitering down Rickett and Mall. So I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling. I am struggling with the logic behind these agencies. Catherine Healy says the collective has been talking with sex workers to explain the residents' concerns. And she says most have moved back into the central business districts. The numbers have reduced dramatically, so that's good. And we'll keep up the pressure on the sex workers so that they don't cause disharmony in the neighbourhood. But a city councillor, Dion Swiggs, says he's not happy with the police's position. From our perspective, it's just like, actually, we've got to respond to our residents and actually try and help them 
and encourage the workers in a multitude of different ways to actually respect the wishes of the residents on that street. So, yeah, it is a bit of a disappointment that the police did that 180 on this issue. RNZ approached both the City Council and the police for a response, but both declined to be interviewed today. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Logan Church. At a time when Venezuelans have to queue outside shops for even basic supplies, the availability of ice cream may not seem to be the top of anyone's shopping list. But in the city of Merida, the loss of one particular ice cream parlour has had a chilling effect on residents and tourists alike. Here's the BBC's Jonathan Savage. There are bigger problems in Venezuela than a shortage of ice cream. But in Merida, the closure of Eladeria Coromoto is another sign of sad times. That President Maduro, it was his fault they closed the shop because of inefficiency, because of drug trafficking, because of everything. Manuel da Silva started off with the obvious ones, vanilla, strawberry and chocolate. Then one day, just for kicks, Manuel offered his customers an avocado sorbet. They loved it. He was inspired. Garlic, onion, octopus... A decade after opening with 386 different scoopable inventions in the freezer, the Ladaria Coromoto won a place in the Guinness Book of Records for its unparalleled diversity. Black bean, chilli, beetroot, people travelled from across the world to this city in the Andes and Manuel's little shop. But then came the Venezuelan oil crisis. The economy collapsed, raw materials became scarce and eventually... Even the black market failed to provide. The poster outside the shop now reads closed due to a lack of supplies. The supplies in question being sugar and milk. It was a beautiful ice cream shop that has been here for years and years. More years than that man, that President Maduro. I was surprised to hear on the news that the Coromoto ice cream shop was closed when it has been one of the traditional ice cream shops for tourists for years and years. It makes me so sad. With low wages and the highest levels of inflation in the world, it's hard enough for many Venezuelans to get their hands on the bare essentials. But Manuel da Silva is an optimist. Who knows, he says, maybe we can open again. For all his flavours, that moment, if it comes, will be far, far sweeter. Mm -hmm. That was the BBC's Jonathan Savage ending Checkpoint for tonight. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The Ministry of Health has found Havelock North's water contamination cost about $21 million. The deputy leaders of National and Labour are both ready to give up their jobs to Winston Peters if it means forming a government. An earthquake with a magnitude of 6.5 has hit off Fiji this afternoon, but the Pacific Tsunami Warning Centre says there's no threat of a tsunami. And Indonesia's National Disaster Agency is warning the Mount Agung volcano on the island of Bali has entered a critical phase and an eruption is imminent. Our next news.